Hi, everybody. I'm Brian Norcross, along with Luke Doris. This is podcast number four of Hurricane Season 2021, and it's podcast number 60 in our series. The tropics are heating up a little bit and annoyingly early here, Luke. Yeah, welcome to August in the end of June. Exactly. It doesn't look like June at all out there. Well, let's hope this is a flash to pan. We'll see. So today we're going to talk with storm surge expert Dr. Hal Needham. Hal's gone up and down the hurricane coast studying storm surge events and going through historic records to create an accurate storm surge database. Storm surge is a stunningly complicated phenomenon, so we'll have a lot to talk about with Hal. That's coming up. We're recording this podcast on Wednesday, June 30th, 2021. If you're listening at some point in the future for the latest weather, you've got to turn into Channel 10 in South Florida, of course, or Local10.com, where we stream all of the Local 10 newscasts, the Max Tracker Hurricane app, or the Local 10 Weather Authority app for the current information. And check out Local10.com to sign up for the newsletter called From Brian Norcross. I'll keep you up to date on what's going on in the tropics, and it'll get emailed directly to you every day. There's something interesting to talk about. If uh, you, you go on the uh, the local10.com slash hurricane page, and then you, you scroll down just a little bit, you'll see a blank in there. You can put in your email address, and we'll send it to you whenever something of interest is going on. And there's something of interest going on right now, Luke. Uh, we had a big old disturbance come off of Africa that seemed really unusual for June, and then it plowed into a lot of Saharan dust, and looks like that's just not going to be anything, but the one behind it is uh, of significantly more interest. It's just south of that dust, isn't it? And it's been, uh, they, there's a satellite that passes over uh, the poles, and we get a twice daily look at certain parts of the world and you can get a look at the winds and this disturbance is really close at becoming a depression uh, what it needs is a westerly wind on the south side to close off the circulation if it does that we'll have a depression or maybe it might even jump up to a storm it looked like it already had some fairly gusty winds on the north side of that so it's an interesting day to see what that will do we can say yeah the high pressure to the north is pretty strong and uh, that's going to drive it along in a pretty good clip but that means the Low pressure to the south, high pressure to the north means you have a band there of pretty good uh, pressure change, and therefore you can have pretty strong winds, easily get winds of tropical storm strength. So that's why storms out there sometimes jump right to uh, tropical storms. In this case, it would be tropical storm Elsa, if mm -hmm. I remember the E. I've gotten to the talking about the E storm already. The, the models are a bit all over the place uh, with this. Uh, they all bring it into the Caribbean, but then... Uh, a whole variety of things happen from maintaining a pretty healthy storm up to somewhere south of Cuba uh, as we get toward the holiday, July 4th, uh, to just completely washing it out. It becomes just a moisture surge. So there, there's a rule, and I think it applies here, uh, especially, and it's hard to remember because it's uh, everybody looks at the models, is that developing or weak storms or slow-moving storms are always much more poorly forecast by the models. So don't hang on models for storms that have not developed. Well, and another interesting point with this is it there's a good chance, a decent chance that this is going to be a tropical storm, tropical storm E, a Elsa, and it would be the earliest E storm on record, right? If it does it before July 6th, which, you know, we're, as we record this, we're on June 30th, it's got plenty of time to do that. Odds are that it, will probably become a, a tropical storm breaks the record that we set just last year is not that right is that right i haven't i haven't looked that up um the, it seemed like we had well what, what we had we had six by the time edward, we got to august right is that what, what it was edward was mm -hmm. july 6th okay is, uh, all right yeah so uh it's the stat that seems to be floating around is that this one may break the record that we set just a yeah. year ago but you know what's interesting too is it's heading to a place it's known as the Hurricane Graveyard, mm -hmm. so we'll see. The Eastern Caribbean is notorious for having a difficult time maintaining systems. So we'll Yeah, see, the winds but... accelerate there, and, and so it, it tends to shear the storms apart. But interestingly, the GFS model um, shows the storm weakening, but not, not essentially dissipating. 
uh, like the sure. European model does. But in any case, like I said, don't pay too much attention to the models. The storms haven't uh, developed. Just the general idea that it's going to head into the Caribbean and we're going to have to pay attention to it. So just a quick mention of Danny, because talk about flash in the pan storms, padding the stats. But that was pretty amazing. I think that surprised everybody. You know, it kind of uh, theoretically knew that uh, storms that are small in diameter, pass over the Gulf Stream, uh, can flare up when they get near the coast. This had really strong upper level winds that was really tearing it apart, right? The circulation was completely separated from the thunderstorms. But then right when it got near the coast, the, what happens in a small storm is the winds get deflected by the coastline kind of to the left, which tightens the circulation, and it's like a figure skater bringing in the arms, spins faster, and, um, and that's what happened with Danny, and the thunderstorms flared right, um, right on top of the, the circulation. It was, you know, it's amazing when the theory, you go, okay, that could happen, and then there it is, it happens. Yeah, it was uh, uh, it was a tropical storm for eight hours, but it, it <laughs> popped up and did the job. I did want to ask you, was that spawned from the, there was an upper level disturbance. It looked like it was spawned from that upper level disturbance. And then that same upper level disturbance is what was also shearing it there at the end. Is that right? Is that what Yeah, well, it? well, initially, yes, yeah, so this was a, um, you know, it, it, it was not really a all tropical thing. There was this upper level component to it. And, and it, as often happens, when you have this you know, upper level system, if, if, they if they are unaligned, become unaligned, so that the storm, uh, the surface storm, the tropical storm, uh, tropical system is not under the middle of it, but the upper level system moves over to the side, then the upper level system is blowing strong winds over the top of it. So yeah, that was what, kind of what happened. And, um, and, then, and then it just, uh, when it got near the coast, you had this coastal effect. It was enough to make it work because it had a very healthy circulation. I mean, the circulation was sure. was clear and healthy. Yeah. So uh, all right. Well, so Danny's gone. We'll, we'll stand by. Nothing else besides this potential Elsa is uh, pending, which is what it's supposed to be like this time of year. So let's bring in Dr. Hal Needham, a climate data and natural hazards science scientist specializing in storm surge. Hi, Hal. Welcome to our podcast. Thank you so much for having me. So I want to talk to you in detail about your storm surge database called USurge, but let's start at the beginning. How did you get interested in storm surge in the first place? You know, I was actually living in Alaska. I was working for the University of Alaska, and I was traveling in the Bering Sea area and got involved in coastal climate projects and they actually have storm surges up there from tropical systems that hit East Asia and then become extra tropical and uh, I started seeing these big floods in western Alaska and a fellow scientist this was around 2004 2005 said wow I would really get into coastal flooding if I was just starting my career because you know this was just after Hurricane Katrina and the uh, 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami as well so coastal flooding was really in the news at that time and I uh, really got an interest in uh, flooding in general. Yeah, it makes sense. So is storm surge your day job or uh, what do you do when the water isn't rising, so to speak? Yeah, so, you know, I began to take an interest in this hazard. And then in 2008, I had the opportunity to be a full-time graduate student at Louisiana State University and to study applied climatology. And so when I was looking for a topic then, I thought, you know, it would be interesting to really study uh, storm surge risk and coastal flood risk. And so I started looking for, you know, a database. And then I realized, wow, even though this is really one of the most deadly and costly hazards, there was no comprehensive storm surge database when I started grad school. So from there, I started really building my first data sets. I was a master's student and then a PhD student. And then beyond that, I saw there was a huge need for this in, in all sectors, private sector, academia, working with uh, government agencies as well. And so uh, I've been doing a lot with coastal flood analysis and risk, but also um, this has morphed into doing flood elevation mapping and some other things that really really help communities better prepare for hazards and become more resilient. So who are you doing this work with, Hal? Is it Louisiana State University or is it a private entity? 
Yeah, so originally my graduate work was with Louisiana State University, but now I'm a climate data and natural hazard scientist with flood information systems. So uh, technically we're in the private sector, but we work a lot with communities. We get grants. We, we partner a lot with nonprofits and academics and um, government agencies as well. I see. Okay, so when a hurricane impacts the coast, like happened in Louisiana last year, how, how many times? More than once, many, several times. What do you do when you go out during or after a storm? You know, what I realized is that now it's great. We have a lot more data than we used to. We have tide gauges that are out there. The USGS is out there putting up mobile um, uh, storm surge sensors. But I realized some of these, uh, you know, certain communities, like for example, Biloxi, Mississippi, there is no real tide gauge near that community. And so I'll often try to go into places like Biloxi or other, other communities where there's a gap in the tide gauges and we uh, deploy these flood monitoring systems. So essentially it's, it's capturing storm surge, but in a different way, instead of just a sensor that's out there on the beach or in the field, we'll often put these flood monitoring systems at, at people's homes. And so all we need is that someone's willing to let us enter their property and they need to have an elevation certificate. That's an official survey that a surveyors come to their property and survey the elevation of the ground and also their first floor elevation, um, their first floor elevation level. We will come in and actually calibrate this flood meter so that it, it's it's already surveyed and we're documenting then the flood levels at that location. So, typically I do like to travel during hurricane season. I like to do field work on the ground and I like to try to find areas where we can fill in the gaps where there is not that much uh, observed storm surge data. So you were in Louisiana, as I recall, during Laura and Delta and maybe other storms. What was that experience like? And uh, there's a place, for example, where there are big voids in the uh, water level measuring systems that we have out there. Did you uh, deploy your, your strategy uh, through Cameron and uh, nearby places in Louisiana, for example? Yeah, that is a, a great question. So I was on the ground there for Hurricane Laura and Hurricane Delta. Laura was just so catastrophic and vicious. I mean, coming in with maximum sustained winds around 150 miles an hour. I was in a parking garage in the southern part of Lake Charles. And I like parking garages. It gets you up above the flood water, but you have a 360 degree view. Um, actually, a security guard kicked me out of the parking garage. That had never, never happened before, uh, just before the outer bands came in. And so I ended up driving back home to Galveston where, where I live for the landfall. And then I was back in the field the next day. I was able to do some field assessments and field measurements the day after or actually two days after landfall. And, yeah, that area down by Cameron and Creole and uh, Grand Chenier and these other areas just got pounded by the storm surge there from Laura. There was a, a lot of storm surge on the coast and even inland, fortunately, in, in more of the rural areas of the coastal prairie. For Hurricane Delta, I was actually on the ground in a place called Delcom, Louisiana, where there was a, a decent surge that pushed in there through Vermilion Bay. And I deployed one of these sensors right there at the port in Delcom. And that was interesting because there was a grocery store right next to the port and they had a high water mark from that had come from Hurricane Hurricane Laura uh, about six weeks before. So that's really interesting when we can see multiple high water marks in a community, either from storms in the same year or from different years. Yeah, and there in southern Louisiana, you see a lot of businesses down along the coast where it uh, shows the storm surge from historic storms too, right? It, uh, uh, you know, that's a storm surge prone part of the world there. Um, back to Hurricane Audrey and, you know, not to mention Katrina and Gustav and Lily and Isabel and all these other storms that have been in that area. Yeah, for sure. And they've really been getting hit really bad in the last 15 to 20 years. Like you mentioned with Lily, Rita, Ike, and now Laura, they've been getting some huge saltwater floods there in South Louisiana. So people are aware of their risk and it's amazing. You can go into these communities and people have a, a very strong memory of what's flooded in the past. Yeah. Is there, is there anything that you particularly learned from the 2020 storms, I mean, our, our technology and our understanding of uh, storm surge has uh, come along a lot. Does anything stand out to you that, that came out of, of those two events? 
You know, something that really stands out to me is uh, this concept of citizen science, of coming alongside, you know, I, I'll do a post on social media and I can't believe how quickly I'll get a dozen people say, absolutely, we, we would love to help in any way possible. You know, here's my elevation certificate. Here's my property location. Um, you can absolutely come out and install a sensor. People like that idea of participating, you know, and depending on the storm, if it's say a week or tropical storm with just a lot of flooding, uh, people in an elevated home might actually stay there through the storm and they can actually be uh, capturing uh, f photos of the water on the flood meter through the storm. There, there was a couple that stands out to me. They were celebrating their 47th wedding anniversary last year during Tropical Storm Beta in Texas. And I, in, in that case, I said, hey, could you just take a picture of the water level at least every three hours? So they were doing it through the day and I got a picture at 9 p.m. And then at midnight, you know, I get this picture from them and I thought, I, I can't believe, you know, they, they stayed up really late. And then 3 a.m., you know, here comes another picture. And I said, y'all can get some sleep, you know. And they, they just said, hey, th w this is a great thing. We love being a part of this. And they were elevated. They were safe. But they were capturing at least every three hours the water level. Through those data, we could create a real-time flood inundation map for their community because we knew exactly where the water was. So, you know, that that interest that people are staying up all night collecting observations and sharing them, I just I hadn't really seen that before, and it was really exciting. Yeah, I can imagine. So you were in Lake Charles initially, and initially, of course, the uh, storm surge was forecast to come, or it could come, as far inland as Lake Charles, like 30 miles inland up through the Calcasieu River because uh, depending on which side of the Calcasieu Pass there, the uh, eye of uh, Laura went, if it went to the left, it was gonna drive the water all the way up uh, into Lake Charles, which is a pretty scary kind of a storm scenario. It just missed to the right and they didn't get the worst storm surge. They got instead a horrible windstorm there. But, uh, and I'm sure that's a kind of a particular uh, scary storm scenario, but in your time looking at this, what's a you know a, a especially scary situation or difficult situation or dangerous uh, situation that you've seen that could have happened or did happen? You know, for me, the night before Hurricane Michael struck Mexico Beach, I was in Mexico Beach and I was looking for a way to monitor this and document this storm, obviously without putting myself in grave danger. At the time, we didn't know it would make landfall as a Cat 5, but it was rapidly intensifying. Uh, the issue with Mexico Beach is there were really no parking garages. So mm -hmm. I found a really nice concrete stairwell that would get me up but i had you know my vehicle with a couple weeks of supplies and i didn't want to lose the vehicle so i you know as i looked at that i, I said it's really possible that i'm going to lose this vehicle if i have to leave it on on the ground and so that was a situation where you know i, I really wanted to document that and understand that storm surge but at the same time not uh, you know endanger my life or lose my vehicle. So I did end up leaving Mexico Beach. I went over to Panama City Beach, rode out the storm, and uh, got back into Mexico Beach uh, really the next afternoon later. I'm sorry, it made it made landfall, I believe, on a Wednesday, and then late Thursday I was able to get back in. And, and that was just so catastrophic from the wind and the surge. Um, really got pounded. I don't even think I would have found my vehicle again. I mean, that whole area took on a massive, you know, 15 to 16 foot surge, and, and entire houses were just completely gone, you know. So th that was a bit of a dicey storm chase. You know, I, I do like to document this stuff, but obviously don't want to put myself in grave danger. Uh, the, the survivors I talked to on the ground immediately after, um, there were people that survived the storm there in Mexico Beach. They said, you know, be glad that you weren't here. And, and they described really horrific account of a Cat 5 making landfall right in their town. I wasn't there when you were, but I was there eight months later. And I spoke to some survivors as well. We do a hurricane special on Channel 10 every year. And uh, I was sent and uh, covered Hurricane Michael. And I saw the carnage still, you know, houses were, they were just flat and they were gone. I'm sure that there'd been a lot of cleanup by then, but it was carnage. And people were still shell-shocked and still living in uh, their, their trailers that were, they weren't FEMA, they were insurance trailers. Those that did have insurance, which a lot of people in Mexico Beach did not. Uh, but awful, awful storm surge there. What are some particular feats of storm surge that maybe surprised you? And tell me more, if you would, about your process of your actual hurricane hunt and the preparing, the chase, and how you get set up and keep yourself safe. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, we just don't want to get blindsided by these storms. We'll say from running the U.S. Storm Surge database, you surge. When you go back in history and you're looking at storm surge observations back to the middle 1800s, usually there are a couple storms in history that give you a pretty good indication of the storm surge potential in a certain. Probably the, the biggest thing that I see when I work in coastal communities is people People will tell me, hey, I've lived here 30, 40 years. My property never floods. And, you know, when you look back deeper in the data, you say, wow, do you realize in Corpus Christi there was a 15-foot surge in 1919? You know, they haven't had surge even uh, uh, flood any roadways in the past 40 years. But when you go back deeper in time, often you find these huge events. So I think knowing the history can help keep us from being blindsided. It certainly helps me as a scientist and a, and a hurricane chaser to be aware of uh, past history, but then also realizing there can be new storms that we haven't seen yet. So you always want to give yourself a buffer and, and give yourself um, you know, a, a margin for error. Uh, some things that I do when I want to get out there and chase, I like to be involved with the community. So I, I do like to contact people in the community ahead of time deploy these uh, storm, these flood monitoring systems at people's homes if possible. I like to, you know, get those those sensors set up. I, I also realize the very well organized, very well prepared and getting in very early. You know, often if you can get in, say, 48 hours before landfall or something like that, you're giving yourself some time to do field work before really evacuation is finished and also before you really have any of the impacts from the storm. So getting to the, the a storm area early also helps as well. And then I getting up, I mean, I really love parking garages for chasing or, you know, just you don't want to be in an area where you possibly could could take on flooding. So if there's a way that you can get up on some local topography or in a parking garage, something like that, um, that is an ideal place to be. Yeah, you say get there early. It's not always an easy thing, as we saw, you know, with Michael. Michael was a very rapidly intensifying kind of you know, short fuse situation. But you mentioned Michael. Michael and Laura, you know, uh, Cat 5, Cat 4, they have to really stand out for you. What are some other storms that you've surveyed that stand out? You know, Hurricane Florence was interesting to me in 2018. And the reason it's interesting, I live in the Houston-Galveston area. And so we were all, you know, very devastated by Hurricane Harvey in 2017. Well, in 2018, I was on the ground in North Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, talking to some folks as, as Florence was coming in, you know, with a big impact there, especially in North Carolina. And just from talking to people, even professionals, like I, I, I spoke with people on a professional video crew, and, you know, we were talking about this storm. And what surprised me in that storm is so many people said, I, I feel safe with this because I did okay during Hugo. And my thought is this isn't a Hugo, it's, it's a very different type of a storm. And so if you remember back to Florence in 2018, it was forecast really to stall out. And I was thinking, you know, this may be a lot more similar to a Hurricane Harvey that just stalls than a, than a Hugo that's a little bit stronger but moves through. And so I remember telling people on the ground, this isn't a Hugo, it's more like a Harvey. And honestly, people said, who's Harvey? They, they, you know, they really didn't have this concept. And what I realized in that moment, you know, we in the weather business know about all these storms. But for most people that, you know, they're a school teacher, they're a veterinarian, they're just picking their kids up from ballet. They, they really know about a couple of storms that impacted their community. They maybe remember seeing something about Harvey on the news. But if they weren't in Texas, you know, Harvey for them was just a, a news story. And so... I remember telling this camera person, he said, my family evacuated to Fayetteville, North Carolina. They were just they were just inland 30 miles. And some of the rainfall forecasts were 25, 30 plus inches of rain. And he said, do you think they're safe? I said, look, this may be similar to a Harvey in the sense that it could stall out. And, you know, people just evacuating inland 30 miles, they it very well could be flooded out. And I remember this camera guy said, excuse me, I want to call my family and tell them, you know, maybe they need to evacuate a little farther. And so that was a story that stood out to me where, you know, people on the ground, I think they were comparing back to a Hurricane Hugo, but a stalled out hurricane, as we've seen, you know, when you get 35 inches of rain in your community, it doesn't matter what the category number is, it, the flood potential can go through the roof. Um, every storm's different, and I think it, it does help us if we can compare to what's happened in other locations. You know, we can be aware about a stalled out storm or something like that. Yeah, well, once yeah, we you get once you get out of the low country in in the Carolinas, of course, then you get into hilly country. I mean, significantly hillier than in Texas, right? So a lot of rain in the hills is a whole different thing. You know, we have that issue in South Florida. People 
say, well, I was in Fort Lauderdale or Hollywood or something. I went through Hurricane Andrew, so I know what hurricanes are like. <laughs> it's like people in South Carolina saying, I no. went through Hurricane Hugo. Well, Hurricane Hugo, talk to the people in McClellanville and uh, points north of, of Charleston about Hurricane Hugo. Then, then you're talking about a serious hurricane. You know, if you get the fringe effects of it, that's a whole different thing. Yeah. Guys, one last lesson learned from last year. I was in Dauphin Island, Alabama when Hurricane Sally came through. I was in the Western Eyewall, but I was texting. I had lived in South Alabama for about seven months and uh, our parent company, CNC, is located in Mobile. So I have a lot of friends in South Alabama. I was texting with friends over by Orange Beach and Gulf Shores. This is in extreme Southeast Alabama, very close to the Florida border. And at that point, Hurricane Sally was, the forward motion was only two or three miles an hour. And they were just getting hammered and the storm surge was coming up incredibly quick in some very localized areas. And, you know, a lot of people, I think, were tar taken off guard. This, you know, previously was barely a Category 1, and suddenly, you know, it's up to a Cat 2 and moving very slow. And storm surge in some localized areas, like this place called Terry Cove, and some very small channels of water were just taking in an incredible amount of salt water. It shocked a lot of people, and it, I think, reminded all of us just how localized storm surge flooding can be. When you have the eye wall of a hurricane set up over a bay or an inlet, you know, you can see four or five, six feet of water rise very quickly. And I think it took people off guard. And you know, in a, in a very small geography, a storm like that, you might actually get your 500 year flood or something like that. That could actually be worse in a very small geography than say a Hurricane Ivan or a Katrina. In fact, some people on the ground said this was worse than both of Ivan and Katrina, which really had broader geographic impacts. But in a small area, sometimes just the right storm in the right position moving slowly could actually be the worst storm they've ever seen. Yeah, well, Luke and I have talked with the Hurricane Center folks about Sally uh, on the podcast here, and it was a really uh, difficult storm to forecast and a storm that was not well forecast, and the strength of it in the western Florida panhandle was a surprise. What Was it, Luke, that they, they went right to hurricane warning, right? There was no hurricane watch. I think they were under a tropical storm. They were thinking they were going to get tropical storm strength winds, and then suddenly the, the storm just kept drifting east. Wasn't that it, Luke? I, Brian, I'm gonna be honest. A lot of 2020 stuff, it kind of melds together. You you have a really solid brain for cataloging all of that. For me, I, I have a more difficult time, so I can't say with. I think that's what. Well, I, I th as I recall, that you, you may know how they, they, I think they had a tropical storm warning. They were expecting basically tropical storm uh, conditions, and then they end up with a hurricane. And ended up with an extra two to three feet of water uh, above what they were widely anticipating. I'm kind of with Luke on this one. I think I think we have to agree, Brian. You have this encyclopedic uh, mind, which is amazing. What I do remember, though, from um, from Western Florida, there, I think some folks and friends of mine over by Pensacola were really surprised by not only the wind but the surge with that. Right. And uh, right. something we do with you, surge, we actually build out a community's entire uh, storm surge history. And so for Pensacola, we have high water marks for 59 hurricanes and tropical storms going back to the late 1800s. And Sally was actually the fourth uh, high uh, fourth highest water level all time. So I think people were surprised to see a, a number four on the list coming out of this storm that, like you said, people may have just been expecting tropical storm force winds. Uh, Dr. Needham, real quick, I'll just make this quick question. If you read about the Galveston hurricane, in the accounts it sounds like it was almost a tidal wave with the storm surge. How quickly does storm surge rise? How quickly can it rise, generally speaking? <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, generally it's pushing in. It, it almost looks more like a river. Often the waves in a storm surge are very low height, but what we call high frequency. So you're seeing a lot of little waves push in and it almost looks like it's flowing in like a river typically. But that said, there have been some special cases. A lot is really dependent on where the eye wall sets up in relation to the coastal geography and the coastal profile. So uh, a storm that comes to mind is Super Typhoon Haiyan. Mm -hmm. in the Philippines, um, you know, which was very powerful. Maximum sustained winds, I think, were around maybe 190. It was, it was really up there. But the way that, that uh, the eye of that storm came in 
um, over over this bay, it actually was pushing the water out. And then, you know, the eye passed. And when the winds turned around and they got this onshore wind in places like Tacloban, it almost really looked like a tsunami. I mean, it, you you almost had an instantaneous surge in that case, pushing in, you know, four or five meters, about 15 feet high, just just almost immediately. And then the, the total water level there, I think was 22, 23 feet. But in some of those cases where the, basically the eye is pushing, you know, very strong winds are pushing water offshore and then the eye passes and then the winds turn around onshore, you can get extremely rapid water level rises that almost look like a quote unquote tidal wave, if you want to call it that. That's rare, but it can happen. Yeah, and uh, to the east of the Globon actually, there's actually incredible video of the storm surge, it kind of came over a uh, an offshore reef kind of thing. So when it finally came over that, it came over in a big like then a super fast rush, uh, you know, rising many many feet in in no time. I was actually I was into Club on a, a week after High End. It was uh, that was an unbelievable thing, one of the most amazing uh, trips I ever took. So you uh, live in Galveston now, right? I think you said how. And obviously, the Galveston has a rich hurricane history, um, kind of like Miami, including the epic 1900 hurricane, of course, and the just amazing and crazy and tragic stories from before, during, and after that storm. And then the building of the seawall. I mean, just the building of the seawall is such a, an unbelievable story. And then another category for... It's in 1915, just what, six or seven years after they got the seawall done. And then in 2008, Hurricane Ike, a giant Category 2, made us all aware of how much storm surge even a Category 2 can generate if it's a big diameter storm and in the Houston Galveston area and then the petrochemical problems and everything. And with all of that, there's been talk uh, about the hurricane threat and Houston and Galveston and the idea of building a big gate at the entrance to Galveston Harbor called uh, the Ike Dyke. Uh, what's, the, what's the status of that and what would that do and how would that change the, the, the storm surge threat potential for Galveston and the Houston area in general? Yeah, so the upper Texas coast has this really big storm surge risk, not only from the amount of hurricanes that make landfall, but the water depth offshore, or what we call bathymetry, is actually very shallow. So if, if you go walking 100 yards offshore in Galveston, you're maybe not even up to your waist in water. If you do the same thing in Miami, you're probably above your head in water. That shallow profile there really pushes big storm surges in. So like you said, we've had big storm surges in 1900, 1915, 1960 in Hurricane Carla, uh, somewhat of a big surge in 1983 with Alicia, but Hurricane Ike in 2008 was, was a huge surge. Galveston City itself, I would say, has been pretty lucky in the past several decades. A lot of people consider Ike to be a, a worse case because the eye came right over our city, but had the eye been 20, 30 miles to the southwest, the surge would have been a lot higher. Uh, last year during Hurricane Laura, there was there was a time I think where the Euro model was actually bringing Laura in as a Cat Four, just south of Galveston. Uh, you know, I don't think many people realize how devastating that could have been. So, like you mentioned, Galveston has uh, had a lot of hurricane history. The 1900 hurricane killed six to 8,000 people. It was the deadliest natural disaster in U.S. history. And like you said afterwards, a, a seawall was built from 1902 to 1904. And the entire island was actually raised in what was called the grade raising project. So this was a six year project to raid the gra raise the grade of the island. It really helped minimize those impacts in 1915 and other years. But um, a lot of people think because we have the seawall and because we've raised the island that we're safe from hurricanes. But I've noticed that with the island sinking, a lot of upper Texas coast is subsiding or sinking, sea levels are rising. Right now, um, this, the top of the seawall, which is the highest part of our island, is only about 12 feet higher than high tide. And so, you know, Laura came in with a 15, 16 foot surge that would have completely washed over Galveston Island. And then some of the biggest impacts would be in Galveston Bay there, we have some of the largest petrochemical uh, facilities in the world. And as we know with storm surge, often surge levels peak on the inside parts of bays and inlets. And so often people think of harbors and bays as safe places, which they usually are conventionally, but in a hurricane, that's where we can actually see the highest water levels. So I'm very concerned about the 
potential flood impacts, both from flooding, but also from, you know, potential uh, petrochemical accidents. If, if a, you know, if a direct Cat 4 or even a Cat 3 hurricane hit there in Galveston Bay, there has been a lot of talk about building this coastal spine, coastal flood protection system. Some people call it the Ike Dyke. It could potentially be a very large uh, seawall that goes, uh, you know, more than 70 miles up and down the coast and actually um, protect certain areas of Galveston Bay. We've talked about this gate system where potentially there could be a gate system at the um, entrance to Galveston Bay to keep water out of the bay. You know, in general, I'm a fan of really anything that gets out there and helps mitigate against these disasters. The numbers we consistently hear are that every dollar spent preparing for floods and mitigating against them, you know, we often save five or six dollars in recovery. So often people say, hey, we don't have money for this stuff. I would make the argument uh, we, we can't afford not to do it, you know, but the question is, how do we move forward most strategically? Personally, I think what would be great is like, for example, Galveston, we're protected on one side, but, you know, to finish out that seawall and make what we call a ring levy, you know, just to basically, um, you know, to make a, a levy around these dense developed areas, I don't think we can protect all of suburban sprawl with a levy, but in areas where you have denser development or areas where you have a dense amount of petrochemical industries, I think targeting levees and walls in those specific critical areas with high population density or heavy industry, I think that makes sense. You know, getting out to a gate system, something like that, it's definitely more complex, not only with designing it, but also there's been a lot of talk, you know, what would the environmental um, impacts of that be? Would that change the exchange of salt and fresh water? Would that really impact the environment? I think a lot of that still needs to be studied. So I'm concerned if we start with a gate system, the cost of it will be, that'll be the most expensive thing to build and the most complex thing to build. I would recommend starting with protecting our high density areas and our highly industrial areas, but I think we cannot afford not to do some kind of protection. There's a similar discussion going on here. The Army Corps of Engineer uh, just proposed a 20 foot wall in Biscayne Bay. And you were talking about bays moments ago and how they, you know, may, sometimes are thought of as safe, safe harbor, but we have uh, Biscayne Bay just south of Key Biscayne where ocean water can just surge right into that. How is the Houston Galveston area different from Miami? Yeah, that's a good question. So we, we have a, a large bay there uh, with, with Galveston Bay, which I think is a little bit different than Biscayne Bay. Biscayne Bay seems to more go like along the shore there, if I remember. Um, you know, both of those areas would be localized maximum for where we could see uh, storm surge. I'm thinking down by, say, Cutler Bay or area over, you know, even those areas by the Deering Estate getting south of the city of Miami. Those areas along the bay there, I think we, we could actually see some some localized maximum. And the same thing with Galveston, the localized maximum I think that we could see would be, say, a slow moving Cat 4 or Cat 5 with the eye wall going over Galveston Bay. Some of the differences, I think Galveston in Bay, you, you have probably, I, I think, a larger area, so you could potentially push more water. And then I think the difference with industry, I mean, a lot of Galveston Bay has industry all around it. Um, but the, the general concept of uh, finding uh, areas where we see localized maximum, um, I think Biscayne Bay for South Florida really has this potential to have greater surge than other areas because the bay itself has this fairly shallow water. And if you, you know, put a Cat 4 hurricane with the eye wall over the bay, I, I think you can, um, you know, get some pretty big surges like we saw with Hurricane Andrew, even though it was very small, you know, was able to push, I think, around uh, maybe 16, 17 feet of water there um, with peak surges in Biscayne Bay. Yeah, right into the Deering Estate, I believe. <laughs> so we had another storm that was particularly bad back in 1926. Can you tell us about what happened specifically with that storm and what it would look like if that were to hit today, maybe? You know, it's so interesting to look back at the history of South Florida. We, we see some strong hurricanes in the late 1800s. And then the 1920s, like you mentioned, 1926, we have these iconic photos. There's a photograph of, you know, Miami in 1926 with just the tops of palm trees sticking out of the storm surge in new surge our highest watermark from that that we think is credible is around a 15 foot storm surge in coconut grove and so you know uh, imagining putting that kind of storm surge today in south florida 
where you know we've we've been knock on wood fairly lucky in in recent times hurricane andrew obviously a, a very vicious storm where it hit but fairly geographically small in the center of that uh, centered really south of town with the the peak surges down more towards cutler bay and and the deering estate um when you look back at the 20s and we see the storm of 1926 and we we see 1928 and the, these other storms as well as some of the storms getting into say like the 40s and 50s you know eventually those those types of storms will repeat but we've added so many millions of people so my concern is always for places that have not seen anything big in a long time and that people say oh oh we're, we're familiar with hurricanes but they just haven't seen a big surge if we repeated the 1926 storm for example the great miami hurricane today i think there'd be a lot of impacts there uh, to people along the coast and, and a lot of the people there would have never really seen anything like that in their lifetimes yeah, if we start having hurricanes in South Florida like we did in the late 40s, people will think the world is coming to an end. You have a Category 4 hurricane hitting South Florida almost every year. Well, where do you find uh, the historical storm surge values, and, and how do you have confidence in the records that you find? Uh, have the measurement systems changed over the years? Yeah, that is a great question. I was amazed by how much historic data is out there. You know, you start in the late 1800s with U.S. Army Corps maps. We have some great maps from as far back as, say, 1886. And I, I re I'm thinking of the 1915 map, what I sometimes call the forgotten hurricane that hit southeast Louisiana, right down by New Orleans. This was a Category 3. We have a very detailed U.S. Army Corps map that is shaded. Everything that flooded in salt water gets shaded in dark, dark gray. And then we have dozens of high water marks that were all measured precisely above mean sea level. So uh, a lot of times these are measured quite precisely. Sometimes they're not, it just depends. Often these observations will measure above a certain datum or measuring mark. So you may have a map or you may have a, a source that says this is how high the water levels were above mean sea level or, or mean low tide or, or something like that. We use a lot of historic maps, for example, like the Army Corps that I mentioned. National Hurricane Center provides tropical cyclone reports from 1958 to present. And many of those reports have data in, in the back in appendices. Uh, NOAA tides and currents. So NOAA has a series of tide gauges that go back as far as 1904. And so we have more than 100 years of tide gauge records in some locations. We also have a, a lot, I would say in the past 15 years, a lot of data coming out of USGS and FEMA as well. So we have a lot of different government sources. And then we have uh, scientific sources from people that have published scientific papers or done field science. And then also a lot of anecdotal data. So in my master's degree, I read through 3,000 pages of historic newspaper. And so those were coming from Galveston and New Orleans and Tampa and Miami. And usually with those, you know, you're getting um, eyewitness accounts or just more anecdotal accounts, but that really helps to fill in the gaps. We usually don't know exactly perfectly what's happened in a location, but, you know, once we build out the high water marks for say 50 or 60 hurricanes, we really start to get a feel of what's happened in this location and what the surge potential is. Yeah, just as an aside, um, in the historic record in uh, the HERDAT database uh, the Hurricane Center has, there's a big hurricane that it shows in 1888 coming over Miami Beach. And the basis for the strength of that storm is a storm surge report of 14 feet in Miami Beach. I don't know if you're familiar with that or not. Anyway, um, I just got suspicious about that because I've read a lot of South Florida history and that should have stood out dramatically, even though I mean, there wasn't much to South Florida in 1888. There were communities around and there were people around. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't completely the frontier. Anyway, I went back and researched that and found that the hurricane did not hit Miami Beach. It actually hit uh, closer to Fort Lauderdale and it was probably around a Category 1, if, if that strong tropical storm, because the, anyway, the records were in the National Archives from uh, the Houses of Refuge that were built, one in Miami Beach and one in uh, Fort Lauderdale and then on up the coast into Palm Beach County and, and, and points north, uh, looking to help shipwreck uh, uh, victims, as a matter of fact, uh, that would hit the reef uh, offshore. So anyway, just as a, a, a little aside yeah. about the 1888 storm. That's a really good observation and i've actually extensively gone through the herdat metadata and pulled out you know just as reference for any storm surges that i might have missed it's very common for a given storm that i may have you know 
10 or 15 or even more than that different storm surge observations that come in from different sources. And so we definitely want to consider the source. We want to consider credibility. Sometimes everything matches up. You know, you, you get 10 different sources are pointing towards a 12 foot storm surge. But other times, well, wait, you know, six of the sources are saying 12 feet and four of the sources are saying eight feet. So then, you know, you'll dig a little bit deeper. But um, often there, there's a range, but we want to just archive everything that we can find and obviously give more weight towards more scientific or more credible sources, um, you know, as we go back in time. Yeah, well, this uh, 14-foot uh, report was actually in a lot of sources, but when I actually went to tracking it down, uh, they all came from the same place, and, and where that came from uh, seemed dubious. And, and the, the, the better evidence in this case was that they actually were entertaining there on the beach uh, right after that hurricane. So uh, I'm thinking, okay, they didn't have a 14-foot storm surge at that place where people were arriving in small boats for kind of a get-together uh, right afterward. I think oh. some, some, sometimes some of the confusion may come from really storm surge technically is a still water level height right. above where the water should be. And sometimes people will, they'll tell me, no, I know the water got to 30 feet. And it's, you know, that often includes waves or wave run up. And so sometimes you'll get two different people will tell you very different accounts of what happened. Often the difference may be wave action. Yeah, I think in this case, they got the hurricanes confused. I think he's probably looking at a hurricane in 1876. Um, somehow and just got the data confused in, in this one table that kind of then was promulgated through other sources. Uh, so talk about your USERGE database. How is it different and why is it better than using a computer model to know how high a storm uh, surge can get in a particular location? Yeah, so it's really, you know, the comprehensive U.S. coastal flood data set with communities from Texas to Maine using every possible scrap of information we could find, both from, from government sources, from academic sources, from anecdotal sources. It gives some insights that, you know, you may not see in the modeling. I would say as I've worked in communities and I've run statistics on these data and I've come with what I come up with what I can say to be a, a data-driven 100-year flood, um, often the levels I'm coming up with are several feet higher than computer simu simulated levels. And so, you know, that's something that uh, I think we need to use in conjunction with the modeling. Uh, a great example would be Pensacola, Florida. The FEMA's base flood elevation, what we say is the 100-year flood and what people need to build over is seven feet. But, you know, once we start plotting out the water levels, we see three hurricanes 1906, 1926, and Hurricane Ivan in 2004, that pushed more than nine feet of water there into Pensacola. And so I, I've worked with communities where I've thought, you know, if you really knew the flood history in this location, you'd probably question what the computer models are saying. That said, sometimes the data-driven uh, perspective matches up very well with computer models. And also uh, some areas of the coast just haven't been hit. And so I, I do wanna say, I think modeling is very important and very valuable because there can always be a new hurricane that's very different than anything we've seen before. And the models there are invaluable to provide guidance. But um, that said, I do think that sometimes models may have false assumptions with them. Uh, a, a quick example for that, I published a paper in 2014 that took all of the storm surge levels that I had archived in the database and ran that against hurricane conditions with landfalling hurricanes. And what I found is that storm surge levels did not correlate very well with the maximum sustained winds at landfall, but they correlated much better with the maximum sustained winds pre-landfall. And at, at three hour increments, it always improved to 18 hours before landfall. And then it started dropping off. And so, you know, I found, wow, if you correlate the storm surge height with the, the hurricane intensity pre-landfall with 18 hours being the best fit, you correlated much better. And as I, you know, tried to publish that research initially, there was a lot of opposition, I think, from some people in the modeling community that said that doesn't match with our models. And so sometimes I think it's important to bring a data-driven perspective in that, that may have a different way of looking at things and, and, and maybe, you know, find maybe some, um, some opportunities to improve the modeling, if you will. Just so I'm clear, you surge, it's not a tool for forecasting a specific storm, is it? It's, it's more a vulnerability or hazard indicator from storm surge in general. Is that right? 
Yeah, really, it essentially serves as the U.S. storm surge database. And then from that, we can do data-driven risk analysis. So we can do two or three things with that. For one, you know, we could take a, a city like Galveston, where we have high water marks for 93 hurricanes and tropical storms, we can run statistics on those data to get an idea of what we call a data driven extreme water level. Or, you know, if someone wanted to build a critical facility like a wastewater treatment plant, we could look back in history and see if that area would have flooded ever before. So it helps with long term planning, but I think it does provide guidance as well with uh, short, short term surge forecasting. You know, often we'll see a, a hurricane coming in that has a lot of similarities to something in history. Um, imagine if you saw a hurricane that had, you know, exactly the same track as Hurricane Rita in 2005, but was maybe a little more intense or a little geographically larger. You can use that baseline from the use surge water levels and say, okay, this looks a lot like Rita, but it's a little more intense. That's kind of what we did last year with Laura, you know, to say, okay, we have an idea of the geographic pattern here, but but we're going to tweak it in one way or another with this current storm. So use surge can really help provide guidance both for long-term flood risk analysis, but also with a current with forecasting for a current storm that's approaching the coastline. Okay, makes perfect sense. Uh, is there still more data to gather about the historic storms, or do you feel like you pretty much know what the storm surge was like in the major storm since at least the beginning of the 20th century? I think we really have uncovered almost all of the, the major storms that have struck, but we're still finding more information as we get out in communities. I really like to do a lot of boots on the ground, you know, working in communities. And it's amazing how many times I'm, you know, down the bayou in Louisiana or over in the low country of South Carolina. And someone says, my aunt actually has, you know, photographs during the height of of a certain, you know, a hurricane or, you know, my, my uncle was keeping a journal and has some, you know, some information that we hadn't seen before. So people in coastal communities often have photographs or have stories or, or they know about historic impacts. So we are always uh, finding out more information, but I, I think we have really, you know, uncovered really the major surge events, but it, it helps to build out all of the surge events for an area because if you want to run statistics on these data, you really need a full distribution. So even if we have, you know, all of the big events for Charleston, South Carolina, building out the smaller events, it helps us run more accurate statistics. So what parts of the coast have the biggest storm surge threats? I'm going to guess Tampa's up there, the Florida Panhandle. Um, What's what's the most vulnerable places along the U.S. coastline? You know what's interesting? When I started building uh, storm surge data, uh, there was a there was an afternoon where I realized that the peak surge level for Hurricane Katrina, which was around twenty eight point seven feet, and Hurricane Camille in nineteen sixty nine, which was twenty four and a half feet, they both occurred in the same city, past Christiane, Mississippi. And I remember thinking, man, what a coincidence that the the same city has the two highest high water marks. As I got deeper into the science, I realized that wasn't a coincidence. So part of this has to do with your hurricane history of being struck by hurricanes. But a lot of this has to do actually with what we call your coastal profile. And so one of the things being where you have very shallow water, like say the coastline of Mississippi and Louisiana, the water, if, if you visit the beach and you start walking out through the waves, you have to go a very long way until you get water up to your shoulders. It's so shallow. That shallow water actually enhances the storm surge levels. And so uh, areas that have a shallow shelf or a sh shallow bathymetry or coastline really tend to exacerbate the uh, storm surges. Another thing is areas where you have bays or inlets or areas where you have a right angle in the coast. And going back to Mississippi, we have very shallow water, but if you get a category three or category four hurricane south of Gulfport, Biloxi, you're pushing, you're, you have these winds just screaming from east to west. They're pushing tremendous water, but you have this right angle in the coast because the Mississippi River, basically the Louisiana Delta is just to your west and it creates almost a right angle in the coast. And so not only do you have shallow water, but it tends to get really trapped there over by that right angle. And so your coastal pr profile is important as well. So uh, really the two highest storm surges on record in the Western Hemisphere both happen there in coastal Mississippi. I would say that's the most dangerous place for storm surge, but 
uh, parts of Louisiana and the upper Texas coast aren't far behind. Uh, the, the, you mentioned the west coast of Florida, uh, very vulnerable to storm surge because they have a very uh, shallow shelf. And I know our friends at the National Hurricane Center, when they've run the slosh models, they've concluded that the worst potential surge in the U.S. would actually happen over by Appalachie Bay, over by St. Mark's. Um, you have a very concave bay and it's very shallow in there. It just happens to be an area that doesn't seem to get as many landfalling hurricanes as, say, Mississippi, you know, Louisiana and Texas. But a storm given the right track, I think from what the slosh models show, you could actually, you know, exceed a 30 foot surge in places like uh, St. Mark's and areas in Appalachie Bay. In Tampa, Florida as well, if you had a powerful, slow moving hurricane coming in from the southwest, your surge levels could certainly exceed 20 feet in places like Tampa, St. Pete. But that's a very rare track for that part of the world. Um, so they just, you know, haven't really observed that yet in history. Yeah, you have to go back to 18, help me, 1848, two hurricanes in three weeks in yeah. Tampa Bay, it, like 15 It's feet. really interesting to, to, com it, to compare east coast of Florida with west coast of Florida mm -hmm. as well. The west coast of Florida, you tend to have a very shallow shelf, and so you do have more storm surge potential. The east coast of Florida, you get into Miami Beach and, and places like Fort Lauderdale, the water gets deep very quickly. That lowers your storm surge risk, but it does produce higher waves. When you think of the kind of waves that surfers ride, um, your wave action is higher in a place with, with deep water like Fort Lauderdale or Miami. Right, exactly. So how generally speaking, what do we have to do to live along the coast, you know, to live with storm surge so it's not a devastating trauma when a bad storm makes landfall? Yeah, I mean, one is really knowing your vulnerability, um, knowing if you live in an area with, with heightened surge and, and storm surge potential. Uh, you know, really, we need to either get up, you know, either get away from the coast or get up and be in a very uh, sturdy structure. Keeping in mind that when a storm surge hits the coast, it's not just water rising vertically. This water is moving inland like a raging river. And so if you have any subpar construction, you know, even if you have a house that's on stilts or pilings, if there's the slightest, you know, weakness in those pilings, they can really snap in a, in a powerful storm surge. So we need to be aware of the risk and realize the, these storm surges are like nothing that most people have seen. It's a raging water coming in. And so we really need to get up or, or you know, get away from the coastline. We also need to be aware of our critical infrastructure um, as well. Pl things like uh, utilities and wastewater treatment plants. I mean, storm surge, if given enough room and enough time, could push inland as far as 25 or 30 miles in a place like South Louisiana. So it can come inland pretty far as well. Yeah, and in theory, it can cross the Southern Florida Peninsula south of the coastal ridge. So south of Cutler Bay, there's no ridge there to stop storm surge coming over Homestead and all the way going to the Gulf uh, in just the right storm or just the wrong storm coming in just south of the peninsula. Like an incredibly strong storm, but and theoretically. So how, where can people find out more about your, your database or who has access to that? Yeah, for sure. People can just go to usurge. It's u surge.net. And I'll be updating the, the site throughout this hurricane season. Love to partner with communities. And, you know, we're working on this project right now with Biloxi, Mississippi, where we build out their flood history. And, you know, those are data that we, we're sharing with the community. A lot of times the information exchange goes both ways. People in the community are helping us understand their flood history. And then we're providing a data set for them to better prepare themselves. So uh, just go to usurge.net or people can check us out on the web as well at Flood Information Systems. We're really doing a lot of data-driven flood risk analysis for coastal communities. All right. Dr. Hal Needham, thanks so much. It's great having you on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Dr. Hal Needham, storm surge is so interesting and so complicated. I think that's why people relate to wind better, right? It just feels like wind is easier to understand and it varies a lot less over a very short distance. Well, it's something that you can conceptualize. You could stick your head out your car window doing 70 miles an hour and get an idea of what that's like. You've seen movies, you've seen, you know, it just, I think it's easier for us to visualize. But with storm surge, it becomes almost a trigonometry problem, you know, where, uh, all right, the storm surge is going to be 11 feet. How far above ground am I? How far away am I? What, you know, it really does get complicated. What's 11 feet mean? A lot of people probably don't have a great understanding mm -hmm. of a lot of the terms that go with storm surge. So yeah, I think it's horrendously complicated, difficult to communicate. And uh, it's unfortunately 
a bigger killer than the wind. Yeah, you know, if you ever go to the beach uh, when there's a hurricane offshore and just stand in the surf, you can feel the power of the waves increases. It's different. You know, the, the waves just feel different. In South Florida, we have that somewhat less because we have the Bahama Bank there, which if there's a, a, you know, a lot of energy in the water out in the middle of the ocean, the Bahama Bank, the Bahamas essentially kind of breaks that up by the time it gets to Dade and Broward beaches. But you go to Palm Beach County, especially north of the Palm Beaches, uh, go up to Singer Island or on the central Florida coast, and there's a big storm offshore, you can really feel it in the water. You know, you feel the water being energized. And, and that storm surge, that's, the, the, that's what's behind storm surge, is the energy of the storm in the water driving the water toward the coast, not just the, the tides and, and the regular wave action. So you, can re you really can feel it in those kind of uh, situations if you ever experience Yeah, and you know that, that firsthand from uh, what, <laughs> what you surf. You surf one of the hurricanes back in your Hurricane Betsy, days. yes, I was. <laughs> <laughs> wild, man. Yeah, You're was, a wild one. That was, uh, that was wild, all right. All right, our next podcast, we're going to talk to Robbie Berg, hurricane specialist and communications guru at the National Hurricane Center. We'll talk to Robbie about forecasting hurricanes at the Hurricane Center and how the cone and other forecast communications might change over the next several years. That's going to be next week. Be sure you subscribe to our podcast on your Apple or Android apps so you get notified when a new podcast is online. Or, of course, you can watch on Twitter or on Facebook as well, and we'll let you know uh, when there's a new podcast out there. So until next week, for Luke Doris, I'm Brian Norcross. Stay safe, be well, be sure you're vaccinated, and we'll see you next week.